Hi, everybody. My name is Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of Johns Hopkins Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Brzezinski Current Issue Seminar. Uh, this is part of a, a larger effort being conducted by the Science Foreign Policy Institute's uh, Brzezinski Initiative, which honors uh, the memory and the legacy of uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, before I begin and introduce my guests, I want to express a particular word of thanks to our alumnus, um, Mike, Michael Perkinson of Guggenheim Investments, who is very generously supporting this effort, uh, including uh, directly supporting the project we're here to discuss, and that is Ed Luce's forthcoming biography of uh, Dr. Brzezinski. Um, let me begin by introducing our guests. My, uh, we have two guests. Our first is Ambassador Mark Brzezinski. Uh, uh, ambassador Brzezinski is, of course, a son of Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was our ambassador to Sweden. Uh, he has a very long and distinguished career of government service, including on the National Security Council, uh, and is now in the private sector. Uh, and uh, Edward Luce. Ed Luce is, uh, has been for over 15 years uh, uh, based in the United States uh, for the Financial Times, uh, for the last decade or so as the U.S. national editor as well as a com columnist covering the United States. He's the author of uh, several widely acclaimed books, and he is about to embark on a large biography of uh, Dr. Brzezinski, who, as many of you may know, had a longstanding affiliation uh, with SICE. He taught here. Uh, he ran a, uh, a highly prized small seminar which you had to apply to get into. And when I say apply, I don't mean students had to apply. I mean, professors had to apply. And in fact, I remember being quite flattered when uh, I said I, as a full professor that I really would like to be part of this seminar and he, uh, he let me in. I we actually have another tie to uh, Zbig, which is that he was a very, very close friend of my mentor, Sam Huntington. Uh, and so I met him, in fact, when I was a, a graduate student, and we, we had a, a good relationship ever since. So, uh, Mark, Ed, if I may, uh, let me uh, welcome you uh, to SICE and to the Brzezinski Initiative. And what I thought I would do is uh, start with a, a few questions to Ambassador Brzezinski, a few questions to Mr. Luce, then I will have, I thought we'd have a joint discussion for a bit. Uh, and then I'm going to be opening the floor up for uh, questions from those who are listening in. And what I would ask you to do is use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can begin doing that whenever you like. You probably do want to do it so you get to the top of the queue. Uh, as is always the case, I will, uh, uh, I'm prejudiced in favor of size students. So if you're a student, please identify yourself as such. But in any case, uh, if you would, give us your name. Uh, and if you have an institutional affiliation, put that in there as well. And we'll get to that in the second part of this event. So let's begin, Mark, uh, if I may, with you. Are there some things about your father that not generally known? I mean, people know, obviously, he was uh, uh, President Carter's National Security Advisor, that he was a brilliant scholar, uh, professor at Columbia, contemporary of Henry Kissinger, uh, all those things. What, what are some of the things that people don't know about him? Elliot, I would start in answering that question by saying that what he shared with Henry Kissinger, with Madeleine Albright, was who were foreign policy luminaries during the Cold War and the second half of the 20th century, is that all were cast on America's shores by World War II. In other words, they were immigrants and they went, they experienced upheaval in their life because of the Nazi invasion of their countries of origin and the rise of the Soviet bloc. More than anything else, if I were to try to share with you what was catalytic from my father's early experience was being thrust on North America's shores by World War II and having to start again. My father's father, Tadeusz Brzezinski had been a diplomat in the Polish Foreign Service, serving in Germany, in France, in Ukraine. And the family had expected a diplomatic career because my grandfather was rising through the ranks quickly. And both he and my grandmother and the family 
got very accustomed to that, to that life. And luckily, just before the invasion of Poland by the Nazis in September 1939, my grandfather was assigned to be consul general for Poland in Montreal, Canada. And my father would share with Mika, my sister Mika, my brother Ian and I, many times in our youth, his memory of listening to the Canadian radio in, on a morning in September, 19, in September 1939, when the news was announcing the invasion of Poland by the Nazis. And my father knew that his world would be turned upside down. And so I think that's an important starting point in terms of who he was and how that changed his family. And it changed his family in very real ways. My grandfather ceased being a diplomat and for the rest of his life sold insurance door to door in Canada and wasn't financially successful. They had to, they had to really struggle. My father had polio when he was young. Many people didn't know that he had to wear wooden braces in his early teen years to get around. And that made it difficult for a, a kid who didn't speak English until he was 15 years old. But he threw himself into his studies. And I do remember that he was, if there was a family member that he was most proud of, it was his older stepbrother named George, who had joined the Polish division of the Canadian Armed Forces during World War II and took part in the invasion of Normandy hmm. um, and was shot in the foot during that invasion and was treated by American medics. And that story was told to Mika, Ian and I at dinner times, countless times of a hero in the family, someone who had worn the uniform. Yes, it was the Canadian uniform, so not their country of origin, but had done something important and bigger than who they were. That was very much kind of a guiding light for my father, who then really propelled himself forward through academia. He went to McGill in Canada undergrad, loved Montreal, which is like a, almost has a little bit of a European feel to it, um, but then went to Harvard on a partial scholarship that only paid for his first semester at Harvard, but he went there, did extremely well, was quick, he finished his PhD in practically record time and was on tenure track um, to, uh, at Harvard in the Department of Government there. He met my mother, a Czech immigrant to the United States at a Harvard Wellesley dance. Both were Central European immigrants at this dance. I think both, if they were to tell you, would say they were feeling a little bit like not included um, in the social scene in Boston at the time, but they found each other and they expected to be an academic couple. My mother was teaching art, an academic couple in Boston for the rest of their lives when my father was denied tenure at Harvard. He had gotten into a conflict with a professor of government there named Adam Ulam on intellectual grounds. But intellectual conflicts at Harvard have their victims and my father was one of them and he ran into a huge problem, namely being denied tenure and having to leave Harvard at the end of the year. And when I've had disappointments in my life, my father has always told me this story. He goes, I was denied tenure and I had to decide whether that was gonna be a defeat, which is something that brings you down and keeps you down, or a disappointment, which is a setback, but which you learn from, you grow from, and you become better from. And he said, and I went to New York, I helped build the School for International Public Affairs, SIPA, at Columbia University, but more importantly, I branched out and set my sights on Washington. And he met on Wall Street, a banker named David Rockefeller. And he and David and Peggy Rockefeller and my mom became extremely close friends. And with David Rockefeller's financing this, he formed the Trilateral Commission. And in so doing, built his network into Asia, into Europe and North America, and including rising young stars, including one governor of Georgia, a rising young star named Jimmy Carter. And after Watergate, he said to President Carter, to then Governor Carter, we need an antidote to Watergate. 
you are the perfect reflection. You are a positive, upbeat Baptist, uh, very, you know, clearly, perceptibly ethical person. You'd be the perfect candidate to run against the Republicans. And my father began writing his speeches. And he and Carter developed a close affection. They traveled abroad together. And they, I, we still have memos, and all this will be shared with Ed uh, for his work, these personal writings and personal documents. We still have memos that my father drafted for then Governor Carter on what was happening in Japan, what was happening in Europe, and so forth and so on. And when the unlikely horse won the 76 election, uh, Jimmy Carter, my father was named National Security Advisor. And I remember the evening well when my father came home and said, I'm going immediately to Washington. And the entire family packed up from New Jersey and moved to Washington. And it was one of those situations where um, my father really included Mika and Ian and I in his life without any grounds for us being present in the room. We were just kind of you know, little kids who didn't fully understand and appreciate what was happening, but we knew something was important and our father was very generous in his inclusion uh, of us in his life. And he had almost like a blood brother relationship with President Carter. President Carter protected him and my father came up with good ideas. That was the quid pro quo, if I were to define it that way, between the two. As a dad, he was a great dad and a great teacher as well. Yeah. So I, um, I'm, I'm, I want to turn to Ed in just a moment, but uh, I was wondering if you could just um, expand a little bit on what he was like as a father. I'm uh, fortunate sure. to know your siblings as well as you, and uh, I think it's fair to say you're a pretty lively trio. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, just wonder, you know, a little bit of uh, color on, on on what he was like as a father, and then Maybe if you could say just a few words on what he was like after government service, because, you know, with, with people of that stature, it's always interesting. Okay, well, so what's the story after they've achieved the summit of their ambitions, uh, you know, national security advisor during a momentous time, then what happens? So just a, if you could briefly say a few things about that, and then I'm going to switch over to Ed. Sure. If there is a memory I would like to share regarding my father, as a father, it was what many of the people on this Zoom call would relate to, and that was, he was a great teacher, Elliot. Dinner table conversations were seminars on detente, on SALT One, and we were nine years old. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Um, I mean, it was really pretty incredible. Um, and he didn't give us any uh, much room to say, but we're just little kids. Um, and that was something that I thought was, that others commented to me as actually a little bit unusual. Um, he would literally turn to us at 11 years old and say, well, what do you think about the Iranian hostage situation? I mean, we had just been watching, you know, Sesame Street. I mean, it, but, but he didn't, he, 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 he wanted us to be tested at a young age and the, the um, reward for that is that he would include us in his life. And so I remember when he took us to Camp David and we watched the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind with President Carter in his lodge. And at, at 10 o'clock at night, I was asked to stand up and comment to the President of the United States what I thought of the movie. And to, to this day, I'm 55 years old, to this day, I remember thinking that I was a stuttering mess. <laughs> but you know, we all learned from it. I'm sure we tripped up quite a bit, but he was a consummate teacher. I have a personal letter in front of me that he wrote me and he was a great letter writer to Mika, Ian and me. And he, he really didn't hold back as a, as a teacher. So let me just read to you what he wrote me in this particular letter. And this was in my twenties when I was making all kinds of wrong decisions. He goes, Mark, and I'm now reading, you have a tendency to focus on single goals and pursue them to the exclusion of everything else. But you also have a tendency to shift your concentration very abruptly. This combination of a one dimensional focus and abrupt shifts is a liability that you should very consciously strive to overcome. Life to be good and meaningful and truly satisfying has to be a combination of goals 
pursued with some degree of constancy and these goals should combine career and family and service. And it's a balance between them that ultimately provides the deepest and most enduring satisfaction. To focus on one of them alone is unwise and to change them abruptly is destructive. So as I said, he didn't mince words, but that was part of being a good dad and just to very quickly respond to his post-public service life, one thing, and I'm just very curious to see how Ed treats this, Edward, how Edward treats this in his biography on his book project, um, is after my father left the Carter administration, after the Carter administration wrapped up, I could sense that my father very much wanted to remain in the public dialogue and part of public life advising people who were running to, for president, like President Clinton. He and President Clinton had a very good relationship, worked on things like NATO expansion. He then worked actually very closely with Barack Obama. But my father had a tendency to be stern and even sometimes politically incorrect and in your face a little bit with his commentary. And that had their political consequences. And so on the one hand, you had a man desiring to be part of public life. And on the other hand, sometimes casting things in a way that made it difficult for people to include him in public life. And that was a tension that I saw in his post Carter administration career that I'll be very interested to see how Edward treats uh, in his book project. Uh, but it's, you know, it's also a way of uh, living true to yourself. Uh, true. Yeah. And I remember, I mean, he, Whatever it was, and we we had lots of conversations. Uh, he would give it to you with the bark on. Oh yes, he would. I mean, he no, he would expect yeah. you, he would expect you to give it back uh, yeah. as well. And the other thing I would just say is, I was always amazed as I got to know him at Sice, how enormously well read he was, and how many different sources of information he would be routinely uh, following, whether all kinds of different foreign newspapers and whatnot. And uh, there's really something of a model there. Okay, well, let's turn to the biographer. Ed, um, obviously, this is a fascinating life in many ways and a consequential one. Let me ask you, what are the big questions out there uh, that you think you're going to be wanting to explore in this biography? I think you're muted. Okay, it said the host has muted you. You cannot unmute yourself. Well, thank you, host, for unmuting me. Um, I was frantically trying to unmute, so can you repeat the question? So uh, um, I, I said, look, this is obviously a consequential, um, uh, a tremendously consequential life. Uh, I can certainly, it's easy to understand the, the fascination of it. What I, what I was wondering is what are the big questions that, uh, that you, you know, at this very preliminary stage of this biography, you, you think are out there that you would like to explore to which you think you don't have the answers? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I mean, I don't have most of the answers. The, the one answer I do have is that, you know, as Mark described the sort of cinematic arc of, of your father's life, um, that this is an extraordinary life that needs to be told uh, in full. And a lot of comparisons are made between Brzezinski and Kissinger. And I think they're good comparisons in terms of their intellectual impact on Cold War America and on grand strategy in Cold War, War America. But there are you know, a lot of books on Kissinger and there's 4,000 uh, 4, pages written by Kissinger himself about Kissinger. So there's a lot of stuff out there about Kissinger there is a very good French biography of Zbig uh, by uh, Justin Vez, um, of Veze, um, former head of um, policy planning at the French Foreign Ministry. There is a Polish biography, um, but there is no sort of big, full life biography of, of Brzezinski. And so that's the sort of first um, reason I think this, this needs to be written. What don't I know about him? Well, aside from most things, you know, this is what I will discover as I go through um, his family papers, his official papers, his diaries, and, and myriad other sources. Um, he's what an extraordinary, fierce, and sometimes 
ruthless and unforgiving intellect this guy had. Um, and Mark described um, the mid-century turmoil that cast the Brzezinski's on Canada's shores. You know, Mark's grandfather, that's Big's father, was based in Moscow during the show trials. He was based in Germany during um, <clears throat> the early Nazi era. And Spig grew up in this continent in turmoil, as did Kissinger. Um, and I think that gave him a perspective in the Cold War University of Harvard and then of Columbia that his brightest, even his brightest American born peers lacked. Um, and it gave him a drive, um, that sort of lost homeland drive. Um, uh, uh, in addition to the fact that he was a fluent Russian speaker and could read all these periodicals and these East European journals um, in the 50s and the 60s, that just gave him an edge um, over other people uh, in the Cold War University. He had a deeper grasp of what was going on. I think. Kissinger and Brzezinski were both ultimately realists. That sort of European tinge, slightly pessimistic tinge that undergirds the realist school of foreign policy, you know, is not natural to the American foreign policy mindset, which is more optimistic. It, it perhaps has a more benevolent view of human nature. I think if you'd come from the bloodlands of, of 20th century Europe, it, it, it's a pretty hard one to sustain. Um, so I'm going to find out about him as I research, but I have no doubt that this will be, he's an immensely important figure. Um, and I think not given the recognition that, that um, is his full due. You know, I'll be curious uh, when the book comes out. Uh, and, and when it comes out, you're going to have to have me. I'm going to turn my phone off for my apologies. Uh, when the book comes out, you need, we need to do the book launch at, uh, at size, of course. Um, I'll be very curious to see if you, where, where you are at that point. Because one of the things that actually struck me about uh, Brzezinski, as a contrast with Kissinger to some extent, is that there was still more of a values streak to him. Uh, I mean, I think you saw it particularly you know, a cause that he cared passionately about, and that obviously Poland and um, uh, the, the, and the Soviet Union. I mean, and I think there was, that was, it went a little bit beyond kind of Metternichian rail politique. There was, a, there was an element of passion there. I'd, I'd also, and, and I think uh, I'd be curious to hear your reaction to this, you know, it seemed to me he had this passionate American patriotism too, which is the patriotism of an immigrant. Uh, is the the patri and in a, is different way Kissinger has very much the same thing as does, of course, Madeleine Albright. You know, knowing that this is the place where you found refuge, and even even when you're bemoaning uh, the naive idealism of America, also in a different way loving it. Um, I think is a that's a it's a really interesting thing which uh, you you know, you may, you may end up like, exploring. I, could you say a little bit about, because you certainly know, um, you actually know a lot about his life. Brzezinski, like Kissinger, was something of the hustling outsider to the Washington foreign policy establishment. And I was wondering if you have any preliminary thoughts about that or how you want to explore that, because they, both of them, uh, jostled, the old order, and you know, you just described a little bit. Of, Mark described a little bit of that at uh, at Harvard as well. Uh, uh, let me start with. I'll get to that in a second with with, with an anecdote. Um, when I moved here in two thousand six, um, uh, he was. I went to interview him, um, uh, probably at his size office or maybe at his CSIS office, um, and he invited me to those Brzezinski seminars, those brown bag lunches. And I thought it was just a casual thing. You turn up at these things and you are quaking because his hawk-like gaze, if it, if it met yours, would mean you were asked to sort of deliver three fluent paragraphs or, or he'd cut you to ribbons. Um, but in 2012, I bought out a book called Time to Start Thinking, America uh, and the Spectre of Decline, 
So a fairly um, critical book um, and a fairly pessimistic one in terms of, of, uh, of where America was heading. And he said, uh, look, get your publisher to send 20 copies around to my home in Virginia, where Mark, uh, uh, Amika and Ian grew up um, and um, just turn up for, for dinner on Thursday night. So I turned up and um, there was Madeleine Albright, John Kerry, Steve Hadley. I mean, this very intimidating array of guests. And Spig held up the book and he goes, so uh, this is Ed's book. It's called Time to Start Thinking. Ed, you've got, to, you've got 10 minutes to tell people here what to think. <laughs> no warning whatsoever. And I, th I think I described that as a sort of cruel act of generosity. Um, because it was an extraordinary act of generosity. And then we got into this, this debate. He was um, therefore always an insider. All these people would come to dinner. Um, I think a lot of them had been bruised by him. I mean, you, I'm sure, and the Bush administration felt bruised by oh, yeah. the attack on the Iraq war. Very lacerating, very... Um, um, public and, and really quite sort of to the point criticisms he made of, of Bush. Um, so he was, he was an outsider in the sense that he would go against what we now call the blob. Um, he didn't try to make himself popular. And I think, you know, if you're going to look psychologically at the difference between Kissinger and Brzezinski, that's, that would be my first point of difference. Kissinger cultivates and cultivated everybody to, 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 made it into an art form. He dated half the correspondents who were covering him. Um, Brzezinski did not flatter. Um, he did not sort of play these access games um, and he did not play himself for good media coverage. And therefore I think, you know, his persona was less curated. Um, but I find that quite, I find that quite a sort of, quite an un-Washingtonian thing, but also quite an admirable quality. Well, Hello, I, yeah, yeah. May, may I add to that? Sure, please do. Remarkable insight that Edward offered there. I would also say this, and because I think this is instructive, particularly for the young people on this Zoom call. My father knew how to stick up for himself. And I can just share this anecdote as an example. When my father was young, he began to develop what he thought was a friendly collegial relationship with the power broker of the time, Averill Harriman. And Averill Harriman and Pamela Harriman were among the most influential people in American policy for decades. And then all of a sudden, my father read in the newspaper a quote by Averill Harriman saying that my father's Polish roots explain his instinctive anti-Sovietism. And we're going to share with Edward uh, two letters, um, one from my father to Averill Harriman that basically said this, I just read your quote, Averill, in Newsweek, and just as I would like to ask you not to, in to invoke my Polish roots when trying to explain me, I will not invoke your WASP roots in trying to explain your, your approaches and your policy and your thinking. Uh, that's a, that, that'll be an even, even trade. And he received thereafter an incredibly obsequious letter from Averill Harriman, kind of going out of his way to try to explain what he meant and what he didn't mean and so forth. And later, my father lived in the Harriman's home in Georgetown during the first six months of the Carter administration because he didn't own a home in Washington. So they became great friends. But he knew when to hold them and he knew when to fold him and wasn't going to be someone's sidekick. And I think that was important because he brought that also into the Carter administration. He developed an NSC staff of experts and strategic thinkers. He did not allow politicians to impose their staffers onto the National Security Council. One quick story is that Senator Stone of Florida came to him and said, I'd like, I don't like who you have doing Middle East Affairs, Bill Quant, on your NSE staff. I'd like to replace him with someone from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. My father turned to the senator and said, Senator, I don't put people on your staff. You don't put people on mine. That request was never made again. So he knew how to fight in the, in, in the Washington game as well. And I think that made him effective.
So I guess, you know, uh, you're invoking uh, one of my favorite songs, uh, The Gambler and uh, <laughs> Kenny Rogers, no one to hold him, no one to fold him, no when to walk away, no when to run. I don't think, I don't think your dad knew how to walk away. No. Um, and I, I guess, you know, one of the questions I think for Ed will be, which will be interesting was I look as an outspoken professor myself, uh, I'd like to think, uh, I, I admire the, um, the directness and the bluntness and the candor and, and the, the integrity of it. I think the question is whether in the world of Washington as it is, do you think you lose things by always being that brutally direct? Uh, hmm. Not to say sometimes even pugnacious. I'm, I pose that as a, a question, not as a hypothesis. I don't know, Ed, if you want to react to that. It's, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, clearly it didn't stop Fake from becoming, you know, yeah. I'd argue the most powerful national security advisor because Kissinger, Kissinger was Secretary of State at the same time, but Kissinger and Nixon didn't trust each other. So even though they worked hand in glove, this was a sort of very itchy hand in a very sort of uncomfortable glove. Um, uh, the carter brzezinski relationship was, uh, I, th I think as Mark said, that like blood, blood Brothers. Um, Carter very um, uh, unpromptedly, um, when he declared his candidacy for the presidency uh, in the Democratic primaries, said, I am an eager student of the Stig. Um, yeah. Which is that you just don't hear presidential candidates say that. And certainly you can't imagine Nixon saying, I'm an eager student of Kissinger. I think Kissinger was, immensely powerful, don't get me wrong, and the fact that he held both those jobs. Um, but the, in terms of the relationship between Carter and Spig, well, that, you know, that involved some emollient, some, um, some nurturing, um, some flattery um, of Carter on the part of, of Spig, as well as, you know, taking a flutter on a horse with poor odds. And, yeah. that, and it raced through and it won the derby and, um, and, and, and into the White House as big went. So that's a pretty extraordinary story in itself, the way he picks this obscure governor of Georgia and tutors him in the ways of the world. Um, does being um, so cutting and so direct um, and sometimes intellectually humiliating of people, you know, block your way ahead? Yes, for sure it does. Um, but I think he was right in saying that it, it, certainly to me and to many others and in print, that Washington was getting too group thinking. It was getting too conformist. Um, it was um, rewarding systematic caution um, and timidity in terms of um, people's career advancements and penalizing intellect, intellectual entrepreneurs and, and those who were prepared to debate. And I think even though, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a great career advancement path to um, cut people to shreds. Um, I do believe that um, the Beltway lacks that spirit more and more. Yeah, I, look, I, 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 tend to, um, I tend to agree with that. I, you know, I, just to your point about Carter, I mean, he's quite affectionate towards Carter in his memoir, um, which, by the way, has the title, if I recall correctly, Power and Principle which already is, says a little bit, I think, about his worldview, that he would uh, have the second part. Um, let me ask a different kind of question, um, Ed, as a, just as an observer of the United States. Uh, Brzezinski, like Trump, was a first-rate intellectual. Uh, I mean, they, these were distinguished faculty members at top-notch universities. Did, did, you say, did you say Brzezinski, like Trump, was a first <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I had to correct you at that point. All right. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, you can tell what's on my mind. Uh, uh, Brzezinski, like Kissinger, yeah. first-rate intellectuals. Um, these could, they, you know, they were distinguished academic, not just merely um, people interested in policy hanging around the academic world. They were distinguished academics. Uh, they were, of course, products, of, as we've discussed, of the... Uh, Central European milieu um, uh, created by the advent of the Second World War. They were, they escaped that. They were shaped by that experience. But, but as an observer of the United States, do you think that this was a singular moment 
uh, where you could have people with that much intellectual horsepower who are also uh, sophisticated enough and uh, acceptable enough, I suppose, to political leaders to have the kind of influence they've had? Or was this just a very peculiar moment in American history in the latter, latter stages of the Cold War? I mean, I think post-war America, Cold War America, this was, as you know better than I, um, the first time that America had embraced a total global foreign policy. It had been, you know, um, absent in between the wars. And prior to the First World War, it had really been confined within the hemisphere, the, the Monroe Doctrine, for the most part. Um, so this was a completely new, um, this was a completely new world for America. And, and there was a scramble to, you know, set up um, Sovietology studies um, across the Ivy League and in the think tanks and elsewhere. So that's hard to replicate. You know, if, if you're looking at today and China being the principal challenge, well, we've known that through Spig's writings and many other people's writings for many, many years that this, is, this has been coming. Um, and so I guess we have more Chinese speakers around than we used to. And we have a lot more sort of intellectual capacity to study China than we used to. So to that extent, it was unique. But I do think that, referring back to my previous answer, that Washington itself was a more open and meritocratic climate, intellectual climate, um, partly because of the necessity um, uh, and the immediacy uh, and the urgency of the Soviet um, challenge, um, but partly because it had become, you know, it was less sclerotic. I mean, uh, Washington is, you know, now the product of decades and decades and decades of being the sort of world's premier power. Habits start becoming ingrained, uh, blood circulation starts slowing. Um, and, you know, barnacles, I'm really mixing me metaphors now, but barnacles build up on the hulk of the boat. The, there is um, a very different atmosphere um, in today's Washington than what you what I understand there was in the 50s and the 60s. You know, I, I would uh, I, I would agree with that. I don't know if, if Mark would, but I, what I would add, you're, you're talking about the demand side of the equation. Mm -hmm. I would also say the supply side is very different. I don't think the American Academy um, produces that kind of thinker or, or attracts that kind of thinker in quite the same way that it once did. And that's a... That's a separate sidebar conversation, uh, maybe that we should uh, we should have sometime. But I think it's there's both both dimensions of that. Although I I would take your point. Um, can we talk a little bit about China? I've got one. Ask one or two more questions to you both, and then uh, open the floor up. And I I see their questions uh, streaming into the Q and A. So Zbig uh, was uh, very much very active in building the U.S. China relationship. Uh, balancing it against the Soviet Union, which was the main opponent. I think it's fair to say that throughout his career, he was um, very much an advocate of cl a close relationship with China. Uh, was and I, you know, I remember actually having some arguments with him about this uh, in terms of what he saw as China's future trajectory as a potential rival of uh, uh, of the United States. Uh, do you think that? over time, he would have changed his view of the Sino-American relationship. Um, that's a hypothetical, of course, but if either of you would be willing to take that on, I'd be curious to know what you think. Mark? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to take a, 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 a swing at that. Uh, I don't think so, Elliot, and I'll tell you why. Because his thesis, when it came down to China, and this goes back to more than 40 years, when he spearheaded normalization with President Carter and Deng Xiaoping was that China as the preeminent Asian power and the United States can do things globally that otherwise cannot be accomplished if they don't work together. That goes to the fight against climate change, that goes to economic stability, that goes to counterterrorism, even the current fight against the pandemic. I think that's the way he, he felt why it was so worthwhile 
to explore and to probe possibilities with China. And you have to remember that when Carter was elected in 76, the Taiwan lobby in Washington was stronger then than it is now. Secretary of State Vance went to China to try to begin to bridge build, but the visit was a failure because he took the maximalist approach on on Taiwan with the Chinese, with the, which the Chinese rejected. But my father continued to kind of probe and meet with the Chinese to see what the possibilities were, even as the US geostrategic situation began to regress in Western Europe, in Africa. And so he persuaded President Carter in 1978 to allow him to go on what was then a secret mission to China to meet with Deng Xiaoping and Hua Guafeng, the premier at the time, to see what possibilities there were. And he went in May 1978 with my mother, with a few others from the State Department. And it shows how much tension there was between my father and the State Department that my father had a gift from the president, the president of the United States, for the premier of China of a piece of rock from the moon to symbolize what Carter wanted to offer science and technology cooperation, which my father did not even tell the State Department people traveling with him to China, Dick Holbrook and a few others, that he was going to give to Hua Guafeng to symbolize what he wanted to propose, science and technology cooperation with the Chinese, if the Chinese would cooperate with us on trying to contain the Soviet expansion and ultimately to allow radar on the western border of China, eastern border of Russia. And that was the deal um, underpinning normalization. Agreeing to disagree was the fundamental thesis that underpinned normalization. And when the Reagan administration came in, that thesis continued and then it, and it very much embraced, especially by George H.W. Bush and continued into that administration as well. So it, was, it became a continuing strand, a continuing thesis of American foreign policy. Ed, do you have a uh, thought on this? I think it's, uh, you know, what, what, what Spick did, I mean, at the home you grew up in, Mark, you know, was uh, complete and cement what began with Kissinger and Nixon and the Sino-Soviet split. And of course, that very famous dinner at, at the Virginia farmhouse where he has Deng Xiaoping there and they toast each other, the normalization of relations in 1979 between the United States and China, and they toast each other with uh, um, Russian vodka, right. being gifted right. to uh, your father by Natalie de Brinin, the yes. Soviet ambassador. So there was sort of a great running joke there that this was all at Russia's expense, but with its vodka. Um, and I think that there was an, uh, even though this completed what Kissinger and Nixon, Nixon began with the dramatic Shanghai communique, um, it, he also changed the um, nature of the relationship. Kissinger was about detente um, and he was about the triangular relationship sort of with America, China and the Soviets. Um, Brzezinski and Carter pushed that into nowhere with the Chinese and you know that that involves some costs because you know China is not you know a Nordic democracy uh, but it's for the greater good because it undermines the Soviet Union which was Brzezinski's obsession. Um, and um, you know, towards the end of his life, when I got to know him, uh, he was still very much, as Mark just outlined, he was very, he recommended to Obama G2, that we have to have a G2 world, that you're not gonna fix terrorism or climate change or cyber security threats or uh, organized crime, any of these things, unless you have the biggest country in the world and the biggest democracy in the world working together I didn't turn out so well for Obama, that the Chinese spurned him. Obama then moved to a pivot to Asia, building up um, um, military resources, shifting them away from the Atlantic world to the Pacific world. And Brzezinski was pretty critical of that. He said, you are gonna create what you fear, which is a paranoid China that is gonna become more and more nationalist. I think Mark's right that he would consider today's Pretty, um, pretty tight bipartisan consensus that we're in a new Cold War to be a worryingly self-fulfilling um, path that we're embarking on. But I think that he would uh, no doubt um, appreciate 
that Biden is capable of playing that hand much, much better than, than um, President Trump has. Definitely. So uh, I mean, we, we could have a really uh, interesting conversation about this, but I, I do want us to get to the Q&A. Let me ask one last question to you both, and then I'm uh, going to open things up for questions. So Ed, you uh, mentioned the title of one of your uh, two recent books, um, Time to Start Thinking, The Specter of American Decline. Uh, and then if that isn't grim enough, there's uh, uh, 2017, The Retreat of Western Liberalism. So that's uh, a pretty dark view. Um, and I'm just wondering, temperamentally at, at this stage, after everything this country has been through, Trump, all that, um, would Zbig have been an optimist? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. So if you look at... Um, some of the books, you know, I mean, post, post National Security Advisor Brzezinski is a fascinating intellectual presence in Washington, very prolific, wrote a lot of books. The one he wrote after the end of the Cold War, which was, of course, a triumphal moment for him, his life's um, work was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and, and it happened. Um, and he wrote a book called Out of Control in 1993. And this book was... I guess kind of a sort of culturally pessimistic book. So I mean, if you look at this, you know, the other great grand strategists, I think George Kennan became in, 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 in the later years of his life, or maybe all through his life, frankly, this sort of darkly pessimistic person about the condition of American society. Um, and Spig was nothing like Kennan in that respect. And Kennan had all kinds of, you know, um, um, problems, I think, including anti-Semitism, which I think Spig was falsely accused of a few times around Camp David, very falsely accused of. Um, nevertheless, he did get into a, a culturally pessimistic sort of view of the, uh, the state of America's education system, the lack of civics, the, the um, rise of political illiteracy, um, and America's inability to invest um, in its own future um, that, I, that I think um, was pretty consistently held for, for the last 25, 30 years of his life. I certainly talked to him quite a bit about it. And so his foreign policy view became more and more focused on the need for America itself um, to, to reform and, and renew. And for that, you know, that assumption had never needed to be factored in during the Cold War. There was the, the very obvious fact that the Soviet Union was slerotic, bureau bureaucratic, but capable of terror. America was vibrant, free and open. So it, that, that debate, that was, it was always a given America was a healthy um, society. Towards, towards the end of his life, he became less sure of that. And so I, I'm not sure he would have um, disagreed with the kinds of sort of book titles that, um, of mine that you cited or other people's. Mm. If, if I could add to what Edward just said by saying the following, I think he would have thought that Joe Biden is the right man for this moment. Whether it comes to the issue of China, Elliot, that you were just talking about, from day one, the tone is going to change. That already will be progress. Will the content change? We'll have to see what the Biden team pulls together because there has to be a change in content if we're going to break some of the log jams with China. But I think he would have seen President-elect Biden as someone immensely capable of providing the country a positive and historically grounded sense of direction and progress, especially at this trying time with coronavirus and economic um, distress and so forth. Um, and he knew, and he would have known that Joe Biden as the former chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and tremendously steeped in world affairs will know exactly how to pull together a blueprint for day one to convey to the world that here's what the US wants to do in the world. And by the way, world, here's what we'll need from you to be able to do it. So let's join together. A collective approach is the most effective approach. But I wanna emphasize this, Elliot. I also feel that with Trump leaving office and Biden coming in, he would have been clear to say, not everything under Trump was pure evil. Yeah. There are some good things that happened under President Trump, like the Abraham Accords, expand, extending peace with Israel to Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, 
um, thanks to Jared Kushner and Yusef Otaiba and others working together. You know, when President Carter hosted Deng Xiaoping in 1979 for the state dinner when Deng Xiaoping came to Washington to formally celebrate normalization. My father and President Carter very much agreed against the conventional wisdom of others in the Carter administrations to include President Nixon in that state dinner. It was the first time President Nixon had been invited back to Washington. He had left Washington in disgrace in the wake of Watergate. And everyone said, my God, don't include him. But Nixon had been the architect of diplomatic breakthrough with China. Of course, he should be invited. And the Washington establishment didn't embrace it, kind of poo-pooed it. But you know who loved it? The Chinese, because the Chinese remembered what Nixon had done. So that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of nuance he would have brought to this moment. Yeah, it's also a kind of honesty. Uh, I agree, yeah, uh, that's exactly way. right, good point. Okay, listen, I could easily go on uh, uh, very self-indulgently for another half hour uh, with you folks. We have lots and lots of questions, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> go through them. I'll take the liberty of recasting some of them to maybe make them a little bit broader. But one immediate question from John Messer is, why did, Spig turned down uh, Reagan's offer to him to be national security advisor. What was that about? First, if somebody, if one of you could describe the story and then why? Mark. Well, I, you know, as part of the incoming team, President Reagan was briefed by my father and many others as part of the transition. And they simply connected well developed a chemistry and a degree of personal trust. Part of, I think, the reason why my father did not accept doing that is that some of the close-in Reagan advisors, I remember in particular Richard Allen, made it a little bit kind of clear that this was going to be not a pleasant kind of team, team building thing, that Richard Allen wanted to be national security advisor. <laughs> was what Richard Allen conveyed to my father. And I think that my father felt loyalty to the Carter Doctrine, Carter's priorities, and would come in with Carter and would leave with him as well. That was very, it goes to the intellectual honesty of the man. He was very much about, I asked him once, what is the most important word you think? And when I was a little kid, and he goes, loyalty to me. For him, loyalty, loyalność in Polish was something that he always emphasized. And he said, you have to exhibit that um, and it will help you if you do. Mm. That's the best answer I can think of for that. Ed, add anything to that or, or not? No, I mean, except to say it's fairly extraordinary for um, a Republican president to offer the national security advisor position to the previous democratic president. And um, that I think is a first. Um, and speaks to speaks to how much of Reaganism was foreshadowed in the Carter administration. Yeah, I think that's that's a that in itself is a fascinating line. Uh, a, a question from Guido Franzinetti: How do you evaluate or explain Spig's ability to predict in 1988, or to assess in 1988 that Eastern Europe was in a uh, pre-revolutionary situation? And Spig was somewhat prescient on that one, I think. Um, so Mark will give a better answer, but let me just um, say this. He um, read all these publications. He kept in touch with academics all through Central Europe and in Russia. He understood some of the languages. And in the 1960s, he foresaw the um, bureaucratization of the Soviet Union and its inner decay um, because of its failure to reform under Khrushchev and then Brezhnev. So the term Brezhnev is Brezhnevization, um, you know, essentially sclerosis um, and the sort of collapse of initiative was something that he foresaw and it gave birth to his foreign policy, Cold War philosophy of peaceful engagement, which is the more you engage, the more you're just going to push the system to collapse. You're just going to help along what we think is going to happen anyway. So he doesn't just foresee this in the late 80s. He foresees this in the, in the 60s. 
And if I can add to what Edward said, you know, one of the things that our family is going to give to Edward as he, as he undertakes this book project is a series of letters between my father and Pope John Paul II oh. Pope, Pope, on this very topic. What's happening in Eastern Europe? What's happening to the totalitarian regime? And what can be done to undercut it? And imagine that at the height of the Cold War, two Polish guys, one national security advisor or former national security advisor, and one the Pope, working together, collaborating on trying to understand what's happening in their, in their region of origin and what to do about it. I would say that. And then second, he saw what happened in Afghanistan when the Soviets tried to hold their position there and the Muhajadeen was able to really undercut the well-equipped Soviet military, which had no social legitimacy in Central Asia and couldn't, couldn't fight the kind of war the Muhajadeen was, was undertaking. Um, and there's a lot of different dimensions to that, and we can talk about that, but I would say those were indicia to him that all was not well with the Soviet bloc. I, I must say, Stalin's nightmare, a Polish pope and a Polish-American uh, national security advisor. Um, let me, a uh, uh, question from Lawrence Kaplan, uh, Sai Salam, uh, about the Iran uh, crisis. And in particular, um, uh, Brzezinski argued for uh, letting the Shah into the United States, which in turn... Uh, was the catalyst for the hostage crisis. Did he ever regret that? Um, in general, I would let me expand that a little bit. Did he ever regret the Carter administration's handling of uh, the Iranian revolution? Let's set aside the, the rescue attempt. That's a, a different matter. But in general, that, that handling of that crisis, uh, which, which I think is, you know, I'm sure that's something you're going to spend a lot of time with, Ed. And I think that is properly one of the more controversial parts of um, his, his life and times that needs to be looked at. There are two, um, that being one of them, the other being um, America's response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. And of course, the, the funding of the Mujahideen. And these are obviously questions that he got, you know, for the rest of his life. Um, I, I think um, in both cases, more research is required, um, and uh, I will hand over to Mark. Well, I think, you know, allowing the Shah to be treated for cancer in the United States goes to the thing about loyalty. There were many people who said, my goodness, why are we allowing the Shah to come to the United States for cancer treatment? And my father said, the Shah has been a loyal ally to us. You have to remember that during the times of the Shah, Iran had close relations, not just with the United States, but with Israel um, in the region. So there was great potential for our relationship with, with Iran to be a focal point for peace in the region. And that fell apart when the revolutionaries took over, obviously. Um, and my father's, I think, great sadness was when the rescue mission to free the hostages under Colonel Beckwith completely fell apart for reasons that have been studied and restudied and ultimately led in the create, to the creation of the new for, um, kind of form of special forces that the US military uses. Um, uh, I think that was a tremendous, tremendous uh, anchor on his mind for the rest of his life. So l let me ask, uh, let's broaden that out a little bit. There's a question from Michael Bruno, uh, who's a Psy student who says, well, were there any policy decisions or policy positions, but let's say, well, either one, decisions or positions that he later regretted in a serious way? I mean, I, you know, to, to be part of any administration, as uh, you both know, is to, to make mistakes and uh, stumble. That's not what I'm talking about. But things where he said, boy, I really blew that one. So can I answer that in a slightly different way and one of the two things i said more research is required where you know i'm going to be delving quite deeply is um the forewarnings that there might be a soviet invasion of afghanistan and one or two machiavellian signals that might have um 
helped encourage the Soviets to invade. And remember, the Carter administration is the first administration since Eisenhower that is not dealing with Vietnam. Um, and so it, it begins, uh, 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 in one way, afresh, without Vietnam as this albatross around its neck. Um, and Afghanistan, at the end of the Carter administration, becomes um, the Soviet Union's Vietnam and remains and bleeds it throughout the 80s. And for the rest of his life, Brzezinski was um, criticized by some for having essentially funded uh, jihadis um, and therefore sort of licensed a sort of a crescent of um, radical fervor that uh, bled into terrorism and ultimately into Al-Qaeda. And his answer to that was always that, um, uh, that the trade-off at the time, um, considering the main goal, which is to weaken the Soviet Union, um, was the right trade-off to make. He was, not, he was not apologetic about this, that America did not fund Al-Qaeda, um, and that even at its worst sort of 9-11 manifestation, um, the threat from Al-Qaeda was couldn't even begin to be compared to the threat of, of the Soviets during the height of the Cold War. So he, he, didn't, he didn't apologize for that. He got very, very tough questions on it. Uh, the Iran situation is different. I think he made blunders and I think he, he admitted he made blunders. And uh, one of the sort of tragedies of the Carter administration is that it is remembered uh, as much for the hostage crisis bungling um, as, as it is for some of its great foreign policy successes, normalization of China, the Panama Canal Treaty, the Camp David Agreement, and so on. And arguably, I think Spig would have argued, getting the Soviets into their own quagmire in Afghanistan. So Elliot, if I could answer that, because I think that's a very important question, and this is a little bit of a conjecture, but I do think that it's accurate. Um, and that is, towards the end of my father's life, my father did say to me that there were times when he was involved in politics and in the media where he had been too severe and too harsh. So for example, in the 2008 presidential campaign when he was supporting Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton was putting forward that as first lady, she had been involved in foreign policy and foreign affairs. And my father, on behalf of the Obama campaign, really kind of came hard, down hard on that in a way that the Hillary Clinton campaign didn't like, and I don't think anyone would have liked, but it, you know, politics is not, uh, you know, beanbag, as they said, and my dad was very, very tough. Or for example, when my father was on morning show with my sister, Mika Brzezinski, and called Joe Scarborough's understanding of the Middle East stunningly superficial. I think those are things that he regretted um, because it, on the one hand, he was trying to engage directly on a subject, but on the other hand, actions have consequences. Yeah. And you can't unmake really severe statements that can be hurtful once they're made. And so I, to me, I think though, if there was a regret that he had, it was that kind of thing. Yeah, that plays back to our earlier conversation. It's, a, it's an interesting theme. Um, we have a question from Thomas Parker, uh, you know, and, and I think he's keying off something you both said earlier on, that he's uh, in the tradition of European foreign policy, real politic, uh, in that respect, a bit like Kissinger. I, I mean, I put a bit of a question mark over that, but the point's taken. Yet he worked for Democrats like Carter and Obama, who saw themselves as outside that tradition. Any thoughts? Well, first, would you accept the premises? And if you do accept the premises, what do you, what do you make of that? It's, it's hard to answer that with any precision because there is a blurriness to these schools of foreign policy. People like to sign up to one school or the other. Um, uh, and I agree with you, Elliot, that he was not an amoral realist. He believed liberal democracy is the best system of government for everybody. And that partly, you know, informed uh, the depth and ferocity of his anti-Soviet feeling. It wasn't just that the Soviets were a threat um, externally, is that, that they, 
were brutal and their system was brutal for the people um, who lived under it. Um, so, you know, you, you can then get into the sort of, um, well, I'm a realist idealist or I'm an idealistic realist. Um, and you can get into all these sort of word salads that sound nice, but don't really sort of inform you as to how foreign policy decisions are going to be taken. And I should add, I, you know, we, we're going to start having that conversation about the Biden administration. They are going to be holding a summit of a conference of democracies next spring. Um, and so we're going to get into the question, and here is a good one that would, would, I'd love to have heard Zbigniew's view, and I'd love to hear Mark's view, is would you invite Poland to this summit of democracies? <laughs> I wouldn't, um, but that's just me. Yeah. yeah. No, my, I, again, my father was very much intellectually honest when it comes to the question of the supremacy of law over power and democratic evolution. And, I, and he spoke pretty toughly to the Poles in Polish language regarding some of these developments, um, to his credit. Yeah, and that's, that, I mean, to go back to our earlier conversation, that's, he did that in ways I don't think Kissinger would have. Um, uh, actually, speaking of which, uh, can we talk a little, this is um, um, working off some other questions that are here and we're unfortunately coming uh, close to the end. Uh, could you both speak a little bit to Spig's uh, relationship with Kissinger? Uh, you know, there's been a lot of folklore about that. I spent a lot of time at Harvard. There's still a lot of folklore about it. But I think the reality is actually rather different from what people often think about the nature of that relationship. Uh, maybe Ed and then uh, Mark. I'd like to hear Mark first. Okay, we'll hear Mark first. It, 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 it is like the relationship of two competitive brothers. That's the way I would put it. They are on the one hand admiring of each other's intellectual capacity and on the other hand, constantly trying to one-up each other. But there wasn't a request my father had of Kissinger or that Kissinger had of my father, that the other didn't go all out to try to help. I mean, Nixon's book on China um, was the first time that my father released parts of his personal diaries, the entire personal diary set is going to be, has been given to Edward Luce for this book project, but it was the first time that my father released parts of his personal diaries so that Kissinger could complete his seminal work on China called On China um, about normalization. So they have a, they had a, a great relationship and I saw Henry Kissinger, I, I think it was about a year ago, and he reminded me that he didn't have, as he put it, an uncritical relationship of my father. And I said, I know that. And I think the reverse was true as well. And we both laughed. Yeah. Ed? I like that. I mean, I think the word frenemies is probably too strong yeah. because they weren't enemies, but they were very competitive rivals who admired each other. I, I um, did something called Lunch with the FT with Henry Kissinger a couple of years ago, and I brought up Spig, and he spoke with the highest sort of complimentary yeah. um, way that you know might be even more complimentary now that Spig has passed on. I, I think you know they were quite sort of competitive. Um, uh, intellectually the difference and the similarities between them is a whole nother fascinating subject but perhaps that's that's for another time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that could be another book you know a dual biography. Yeah. No, I want to just offer, offer this up for the folks on Zoom who, who, like me, have a complicated last name. My father, when he naturalized in the U.S. District Court in Boston in the 1950s to become a U.S. citizen, almost changed his name from Zbigniew Brzezinski, and Brzezinski means birch tree in Polish, to a birch last name. Zbigniew would be changed as well, and he didn't just simply because he wanted to keep honest with his Polish identity. But he thought he couldn't really ever rise in American policy with such a complicated last name with so many consonants and so many Z's and so forth, until he saw the name of Heinrich Kissinger uh, beginning to really ascend in American politics and policy. And he knew that ultimately Henry Kissinger's rise in policy and politics would allow someone named Zbigniew Brzezinski to rise as well. And of course, that was true. 
What a, what a wonderful way to bring this to a close. Um, our time is coming to a close. I'm just going to say a, a couple of things. First, uh, Ed, congratulations on this project uh, to the Brzezinski family for obviously making it possible, not only by releasing uh, the materials, but for helping to get the support. And again, I want to thank uh, Mike Perkinson. I think this will be a wonderful book, and I think it'll be a wonderful picture of uh, a life and times and, a, and of a mind. So I'm looking forward to it. And again, I, I insist that you do the launch here at SAIS. I, um, you know, I, I think anybody who's uh, struggled with a biography has reports that w what it means is you have as a roommate for a number of years, somebody else, and they're, you're living with them uh, and, they, and they never go away. Uh, and it can be challenging living with roommates, but I think, you know, you've picked a particularly interesting roommate uh, to spend the next few years with, and I'm just tremendously curious to see what you come up with. So let me thank you both. Let me thank everybody who uh, attended this. My apologies to those whose questions we weren't able to address. And uh, once again, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much.